Sponsored by Audible. Hello, my beautiful watchers, and welcome to Lost in Adaptation, the tiny corner of the internet that I use to compare film adaptations of books to said books to see if the original plot, characters, and themes were recreated faithfully. This, like most episodes, was commissioned on Patreon. There's a link in the corner and in the video description if you'd like to see what rewards are available for funding the channel. Now, I usually begin these things with an introduction to the author, but in this particular case, the story doesn't start there. On Friday, the 13th of October, 1972, a plane carrying a Uruguayan rugby team and their friends crashed in the Andes Mountain between Chile and Argentina. Of the 45 passengers and crew, 35 were left alive after the initial impact, though due to injuries and weather conditions, only 16 survived to go home. They spent about two and a half months trapped on the mountainside, eventually having to resort to cannibalism as their food supplies dwindled, until two of their fittest members were able to mountain climb to civilization and lead a rescue team back to the crash site. Two survivors, Pablo Versi and Roberto Canessa, wrote a book about their experience titled I Had to Survive, How a Plane Crash in the Andes Inspired My Calling to Save Lives, though that is not the book that was eventually made into the film that I'm reviewing. The novel with that honour was written in 1974 by British author Piers Paul Reed. While not a witness to the events himself, his goal seems to have been to write about them as true to life as possible and, to this end, interviewed as many of the survivors as he could reach. He's talked about the temptation to fictionalise certain parts of the story to add to their dramatic impact, but decided the real-life events were dramatic enough without doing so. The goal of this video isn't to judge the book's accuracy to the real event, but as far as I can see, none of the people who actually lived through it objected to his portrayal of them, aside for some slight grumbling that he did didn't do justice to the massive role their type friendship and religious beliefs played in their survival. Which actually seems a little unfair to me, as that was a disproportionately huge part of the book as far as I could see, but they know their story better than anyone else. My personal impression of this book's formatting is, it exists in a sort of grey area between biography and dramatisation. It's presented in the form of a story, but it mostly sticks to a description of what happened and what was said out loud, without attempting to insert much regarding the inner thoughts of the survivors, or painting poetic word pictures of their surroundings. I might even go as far as to say that it felt a little dispassionate at times, though I think Reed made the right moral decision not to add additional narrative or drama to this very real and very tragic event. As mentioned earlier, religion features very heavily. Both the survivors of the crash and the author of the book are devout Catholics. Heck, the name of the rugby team is the Old Christians. Many of the Uruguayans attributed their survival to their faith, either believing it was a straight-up divine intervention, or because their belief that God had a purpose for them gave them the strength to go on through the worst of it. A film based on Reed's novel was released in 1993, written by John Patrick Shanley and directed by Frank Marshall. He's produced a ton of movies and was a co-founder of Ambient Entertainment with Kathleen Kennedy and Steven Spielberg. His directing resume is not as extensive, but it does include Congo, so there's that. Mr. Homoka. Well, stop eating my sesame cake. Stop eating my sesame cake! Nando Parado, one of the brave survivors who beat all the odds on a 10-day hike out of the mountains to save everyone, was brought on as a technical advisor to help the movie recreate the crash and the elements they had to endure. Two other survivors were flown in to visit these set as well. While the cast was pretty small by movie standards, the lack of a main character actually makes it feel quite large, as all of the 35 or so survivors of the initial crash are given a fair share of screen time. I can't list them all, but the credits include Vincent Spano, Josh Hamilton, Kevin Bresenham, Jack Noseworthy, and Parado got to see himself portrayed by Ethan Hawke. The film is performed in English, though they don't change any of the names of the characters. I found some of the acting pretty good, and some of it was... It was fine. It was okay. It's a good film overall, with stunning visuals of the Stark mountain range, a solid score, and the deeper emotional impact that comes with true stories. But does it follow the same road as the book, or strike out on its own? We'll talk adaptation after a quick word about our sponsor.
The unmatched library of audiobooks that Audible has amassed continues to amaze me. Today's subject is available, along with pretty much every other title I've talked about in recent years, and thousands of others I've not had a chance to enjoy yet. By going to audible.com slash noble or texting noble to 500, 500 you can claim a 30-day free trial membership, which grants you a monthly credit that can be redeemed for any and all of them, regardless of their price. And these titles will remain yours forever, regardless of what the future holds for you. One thing in particular I've really come to appreciate about Audible is the ever-increasing amount of titles included with membership. I've recently been working my way through the complete Sherlock Holmes collection, narrated by the honeyed voice of Stephen Fry National Treasure, and I didn't even have to spend a credit on it. All of these Sherlock Holmes books are one of the best narrators in Britain, and they just gave it to me. If you're also interested in podcasts, sleep meditation, or guided fitness, membership also comes with the Plus Catalog, which grants you unlimited access to a huge supply of all of these things. It's legitimately hard for me to imagine life without Audible at this point. Partly due to my ADHD, music doesn't really stimulate the brain enough to keep me from going mad with boredom, so being able to take my favorite stories with me during humdrum life activities like long car drives and housework has been an absolute godsend. So yeah, that's audible.com slash noble or text noble to 500, 500 to get access to the world's most impressive depository of audiobooks. We now return you to your regularly scheduled program. Okay, as usual, let's start with the plot and go from there. True to the book is... The lads messing around on the plane just prior to the crash, only ceasing their antics when they realize that they are seconds away from colliding with the mountainside. The plane losing first its wings, then splitting in two mid-airs. These seats all coming loose and flying forward on impact. The grievous injuries sustained by nearly everyone, including a bar of steel impaled in one poor lad's torso. Two medical students attempting to do what they can for everyone, but being super out of their depth. The snow around them coming up to their waists, forcing them to use seat cushions as not very good snowshoes. Finding one of the pilots barely alive and his request for his revolver, but this easy death being denied to him by the suicide adverse Catholic passengers. One of the few women on the flight being trapped under the mangled seats and screaming almost continuously until she dies. The primary supplies being available to them being chocolate, wine, and a ton of cigarettes. An industrious young man designing a snow-melting water collector using scrap metal. Aircraft occasionally flying overhead, giving them some blessed optimism for rescue, but proving to be a false hope as their white plane was impossible to see on the white mountainside. The worst wounded of the survivors dying off in ones and twos. Eventually, driven by starvation and the need for enough food to sustain expeditions away from the plane, the hard decision being made to consume the bodies of their deceased friends. Three boys heading off on a scouting mission to find wreckage that fell out of the back of the plane. Though they damn near freeze to death in the process, they at least get to enjoy the ultimate sledging experience back down the mountain. An already super dire situation getting significantly worse when an avalanche smashes into the plane, killing eight more people. A second expedition finding the tail end of the aircraft and bringing back its batteries in an ultimately fruitless attempt to use them to power the broken radio and call for help. A final expedition going further in the hopes of finding civilization, discovering that they're surrounded by mountains on all sides, but powering on anyway through insane conditions and successfully bringing back a helicopter rescue team. As its omission would have been a pretty serious portrayal of the book and the survivors of the real event, I'm glad the film took pains to maintain the heavy role the lad's Catholic faith played in the story. They get with the praying and the hymn singing all over the film. Many lines of dialogue from the book are repeated word for word. Interestingly, due to the actors speaking English, this sometimes leads to some awkward sounding localization issues, like a character yelling, Hey, forget your wife! Forget her! Remember your living children! <laughs> To say that the film played down the cannibalism would be unfair, because I'm of the opinion it would have been impossible to include in any film the sheer amount of detail included in the book regarding the cannibalism. This is gonna get pretty nasty, so it is completely understandable if you feel like your constitution may not be up to the task of hearing about it. So, if you wish to simply take my word for it, here is the time code to skip to. So, yeah, the book goes into vivid descriptions of how these boys had to chow down on their compatriots. It started like it did in the movie, with them cutting small chunks off the bodies and choking them down, but after a while, as they got used to it and desperation necessitated, they started increasing 
increasing the efficiency of the butchering process, carving all available flesh away and cracking the bones for their marrow, separating the organs regarding which had to be cooked before consumption, working out a system for thawing and drying the meat on the roof of the plane, and rendering the fats for use in making laxatives. Towards the end of the ordeal, they had to start collecting bodies from further afield and bringing them back like the world's most horrifying grocery store run, and once even these options ran out, they started eating the parts they had earlier elected to avoid, like the brains, lungs, and genitalia. There's even a description of them piling up the heads for later consumption and using the skulls as pots. I swear to the old gods and the new, it started to feel like I was reading a cookbook by the end. There's also extremely detailed descriptions of the effect that eating nothing but human flesh has on your digestive health and the disgusting things they had to do to overcome them. It, it's just a lot, okay? <sighs> Moving on to less horrifying subjects, while the filmmakers were pretty dedicated to realism, they evidently didn't have quite the same iron will as Reed did regarding resisting the temptation to add some extra drama here and there, as there's now multiple occasions of the boys saving each other from falling down massive chasms and cliff faces. The fact that the survivors are Uruguayan comes up a lot more in the book, though it's often in the narration so this wouldn't have translated that well to the film. I did notice the introduction described them as South American American instead of going into specifics, which was a little odd. A minor thing, but they added the lads having to burn money to keep the fires going, which, while a funny ironic image, doesn't make a lot of sense considering how fast paper burns. <laughs> The film concentrates entirely on the plight of the survivors of the plane crash, never leaving the mountains throughout the entire runtime, which is fair as that is of course the main focus of the story, however, the book included a lot of information about how the families handled the disaster and the rescue efforts to find them. One of the main issues was that the plane was believed to have gone down on the Chilean side of the border, so the legally mandated search fell on the shoulders of their underfunded and incompetent air force. Continuous equipment failures and unwillingness to risk any bad weather impeded pretty much all of their efforts to find the crash site. Many parents of the passengers refused to give up hope on their children, and one in particular embarked on a quest to find them himself. He was not ultimately successful, but his determined travels along the border were pretty moving. In a weirder turn, others put their faith in the supernatural. A few of them contacted a supposed clairvoyant for information about the crash. Very interestingly, while a lot of the information he claimed to have seen in his visions proved to be bunk, if the book is accurate to real life, an almost equal amount was shockingly spot on. He did at the very least give the parents the hope they needed to pressure the military to keep searching, which could very well have been the difference between life and death for their children in other circumstances. There might have been a small reference to this in the film, as apparently one of the survivors believed that he had ESP and was shocked that he didn't see the crash coming. The difficulties with the Chilean Air Force were more than made up for by the charity of its people, many of whom volunteered countless man-hours and scarce equipment and supplies to the amateur search efforts. The film cut straight from the start of the expedition's long trip over the mountains to their triumphant return for dramatic purposes, which left out their first contact with the outside world and the generous help they received from the extremely poor but selfless farmers who lived at the base of the mountain range. The book also went into the boys' initial recovery after their rescue and the aftermath of their experience, including the understandable mental health problems that came with it. They also had to deal with the world finding out what they had to do to survive and judging them for it. In a surprise twist, because these guys are usually all about judgement, the Catholic Church stepped in and took a hard stance in their defence, understanding that they had no choice under the circumstances. Final thoughts. So, yeah, a pretty accurate adaptation plot and theme-wise. I'd like to add more here, but this one's pretty clear-cut. I'm glad that with some small exceptions, the film followed the philosophy of the book and retold this true story realistically and respectfully. In hindsight, I should have predicted how weird it would be covering this right after The Martian, as there's some obvious parallels in the stories. I think Weir mentioned taking inspiration from real-life survival stories, so maybe this was one of them. Thank you for joining me, my beautiful watchers. If you've enjoyed this video, don't forget to help hold back the Lovecraftian horror of the YouTube algorithm by giving it some shiny likes and comments and subscribing if you're new. Take care of yourselves out there. Dream.
much love and appreciation to my patrons of honor, Shelby Holtz, Atel Spurdloff, and Trace Carter. Shout out to Il Nedge for the credits music, check out his channel for more parody and original songs, and a huge thank you to this video's editor, Sophia Riccardi. Links to her work in the video description. So Terry, oh, what is your obsession with trying to scritch yourself on the tripod? The tiny corner of the internet that I use, Kuku Pigaboo. I'm wearing a shirt that keeps riding up, so I'm going to be constantly doing the Picard maneuver throughout this. La la la. That god. I am, if you bump the, like, boop the tripod, I swear to goodness.